So my name is Roxana Parag Capiella. Um, I'm here presenting uh, Creating Accessible Websites, Inclusive Principles and Tips. I am the IT Project Manager, though by this display here you wouldn't have known that. Um, and I work for an agency called Cradles to Crayons. It's a nonprofit here in Boston that, um, unlike a lot of the nonprofits and educational institutions I've worked for, is very tech forward and very tech involved. So that's um, very cool. It's co cool to come to a place like that. So um, the reason I'm presenting this website today is um, I have a long history of working around disability issues and accessibility is just the latest um, sort of piece of that. Um, in high school, I worked for an upstate New York residential program for people who had um, what could be described as moderate to severe IDD, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and I worked there after school. My mom works there still, so I grew up really around it. Um, so it's always just sort of been a passion of mine to um, advocate. So here we are. Um, so I am curious, how many people here are uh, trying to find something for their workplace or something they're trying to do for clients? Um, do you work for a nonprofit that um, receives federal dollars so you have to have your website accessible? Show of hands. All right, is anyone here a developer who works for clients who also have sort of that background? Okay. Um, and who just wants to like make sure that their website is just as open as it can be, as inclusive as it can be? Oh, I like that. Um, biggest show of hands yet. So when I started researching this, um, this sort of came up while I was looking around. Um, this came from the founder of Accessible Journeys. It is a man who um, growing up, he had an uncle with a severe uh, mobility disability, um, and the family, instead of you know shunting him off to um, one of these massive hospitals that are just a nightmare, they included him in all their family outings. They made sure he was part of their life. So he said something um, that I thought was just very profound, which was, I grew up knowing nothing about disabled issues. I only knew solutions. So even in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, he would go with his uncle and his family, and they would all go together as a unit. It wasn't, you know, we'll see him once the week before Christmas, and then we forget about him for the rest of the, um, forget about him the rest of the year. He was very much a part of his family. So very sweet. So why? Why do we look for this? So I kind of covered a little bit earlier when I asked, you know, why are people here? Legally, you have to. Um, you risk losing business or uh, taking uh, a trip over the courthouse if you don't. So you maybe want to reach a broader audience. You have a hobby that you're very interested in. And you want to share with everyone else. Awesome. Um, there's a reason why you want to have that broad audience appeal because these are the statistics about uh, various forms of disabilities in the United States. So um, it's considered almost one out of five people in the U.S. have a disability, and that's pretty close to, um, I was at a presentation yesterday about the same topic, what the U.K. is like. Um, there's people with auditory issues, there's people with uh, vision impairments, and these all sort of need to be looked at as a way to really get your, um, get your system out there. So, that comes to our third point. It's just a nice thing to do. Um, it's, it's the idea that this isn't a schoolyard. We're keeping people away because we can. We're being inclusive and opening up whatever our website's about to everyone because it's just a decent thing to do, uh, to have that consideration. So here's just a short list of many. Um, legal actions that took place in the United States over the past decade and a half. Um, so Access, uh, Access Now uh, sued Southwest Airlines because Southwest's, Southwest's airline website was not accessible to anyone with a screen reader. Um, they actually lost that case, but Southwest decided that they should make some changes. In 2006, Target um, also had the same uh, sort of suit brought against them by the National Federation of the Blind. Um, what happened with that, that 
was that the case was settled, and that's all uh, the National Federation wanted. They just they weren't looking at making oodles of money off target. They just wanted to make sure that people with vision impairments could shop. I think that's a fair goal. Um, so then the National Association of Deaf um, sued Netflix in 2012, um, alleging that it was not fair or was not you know, considered a just thing that um, the closed captioning options for um, movies and TV shows were very, very limited. So they settled that as well. Settling, again, is better than dragging something out. And so Netflix agreed to provide more products, more contents. And I think like over the past two or three years, when they release one of their own series, like a Netflix presents, you know, whatever film or series, they're always closed captioned with um, the little um, descriptors of like, oh, man crashes through building. Uh, clearly, we just finished watching Blue Cage 2. Um, <laughs> so then a more recent case was National Federation for the Blind again versus Scribe, which is sort of like a, it's like a journal website. Um, you can get articles there, um, which is great. It's fantastic. You can read up all, all these articles. But they, they, weren't, uh, they weren't accessible to anyone. So in 2015, you have a website that's not accessible to people, um, especially when it's all text-based. That's a little ridiculous. So um, that case was also settled. Um, and what ended up happening is all of uh, their content became accessible, I think, by the end of that year. So now that the Department of Justice is being a lot more proactive with sites, they're trying to, um, they're, not, they're not trying to go after a medium-sized company and get them shut down. It's all about you know, using settlements to change an organization or company for the better. Um, one of the most recent cases I think came out of late 2016, early 2017, was actually um, against Harvard and MIT, local guys. Um, and what that, those cases were about were they offer courses online, which is great. So you can stream you know, this crazy good archaeology lecture by a world famous professor, but, if you, but you can't listen to it if you know, you're deaf and they don't provide closed captions. So, uh, a lot of those those more recent cases um, came around making sure that there were captions for those, sort of like what we're doing now. So, so I went to the Wayback Way Machine just to sort of see what you know Southwest looked like, um, at least on their website in 2002. So, um, as much as they were able to procure, this is a snapshot uh, top right side of what the original website looked like. If you were to scroll over the top of the menu, you would see just like oodles of links, like crazy amounts of links that for just someone trying to read with a screen reader would just be overwhelming, just very difficult to read and get through. So it's still the same in 2004. So I left forward a couple uh, years. And so the top left is actually 2014. And this bottom uh, left one is actually Southwest uh, three days ago. So um, they've certainly come a long way. It's a lot more easy to navigate if you're, for example, just working with um, screen reading software or you're just tabbing through. So why WordPress? Um, I mean, there's obviously something to be said for Word, for the fact that WordPress is literally everywhere. Or it's there for one out of four websites are created through WordPress. Um, so that's, pretty, that's a pretty big incentive to be accessible. Um, WordPress itself has also um, decided that they are going to be accessible friendly. So all of the new content that comes out, like every theme, every plugin has to meet that standard level of accessible, accessibility. So um, what are some things you have to consider when you create a website? Obviously, um, vision and audible capabilities, neurological capabilities, or um, those things. Um, motor um, age, not a lot of people are really talk about age. Um, my mom is in her late 50s and still calls me constantly asking what her password is for her Gmail account. 
I made it the names of her children. She only has two of us. It shouldn't be so difficult for her to navigate. Meanwhile, my grandmother, my husband's mom, um, my husband's mom's mom, uh, she's navigating Facebook and the South Carolina Legislator website to do social activism to get arrested yet again at a public uh, rally or for one thing or another. So age has to be taken into consideration. Um, and then those slide into sort of socioeconomic um, avenues. So, um, so you can look at this as twofold because people who are older may not have as much income, but they might have accumulated a lot of income. You don't know. Um, and it's also a clear fact that people who have a diagnosed disability oftentimes do have trouble finding meaningful employment um, and then will learn, earn 37% less than someone else who is um, the same age, uh, same regional area, same um, race, and all these other demographics. So that's something that you have to keep in mind because when you're building up a website and it's great because you've got all these accessible plugins that are super high tech, you may have uh, to try to reach out to someone in Appalachia who does not have a very new computer, but has a very slow internet connection, and that needs to be taken into consideration. So, so these are some of the elements you do need to look for when you are creating your um, website. It's colors, it's fonts and sizing, it's placement, it's content for anyone who does SEO work. Um, it's making sure all your tags um, are accurate and your alt tags are filled in. One of my big projects at my current job is to make sure the marketing team does alt tags. Um, they very rarely do, so that is my little crusade that I've taken up. Um, and of course, you want to make sure that the website um, has decent readability and flow. So practically, um, what are some of the things you need to look for when you are um, creating your website or when you're altering or updating your website? It's things. Um, so there used to be a time long, long ago where you would have to search for themes that were considered accessible because not all of them were, or some of them were like exclusively based in themes that didn't work for a lot of people. Um, luckily, almost everything that comes out of WordPress now is accessible due to that earlier uh, commitment we saw to having things be easy to read. Um, so that's pretty awesome. Um, Color blindness and site design. Um, I can read color in there. Can, can everyone, or is there a person or two who has color blindness and just sees an ugly green dot? Everyone can see. Great. So, uh, so color blindness, um, I think, is an interesting topic because it also falls into the idea that when you're working with your marketing team or when you're working with a designer, you have to try to create a logo that's unique enough that your brand will stand out, but also is not gonna be just a random blob that makes absolutely no sense um, to one out of 12 uh, Americans in the world. Um, so these are colors that really don't work well together. Um, these shouldn't be seen as, oh, let me make a blue and purple site because that's just not gonna work really well. I like to say um, when we talk with our marketing department about these sort of things, you know, it's not my space. You really shouldn't be having a black background, lime green, anything. And luckily, we're really good about professional colors and conduct, so that's awesome. Um, if you need a resource, Color Oracle, just Google it. Um, it is a very good source to find um, the colors that will work for your group, um, that will not alienate uh, one in 12 of your potential consumers. So uh, music and video, I think everyone can agree that music that starts automatically or a video that plays automatically is the most irritating part of visiting a website that you may not know anything about. I mean, it might, you might have a great product or you might have you know, a great news clip from you know, CVS that's covering some value. But if it starts automatically, if you know, I was listening to music late at night, and then the next day I come to work and then I hear from ABC at like full 100% volume, that's, that's gonna turn me off to your website. 
um, was going to be turning me off to any website. And if you are reading through a screen reader, um, you're trying to hear trying to hear sort of the dictation of the text that's on the screen, and then you're also trying to like blot, uh, you're trying to blot out the video that automatically started. So that's not a good thing for anyone. So just don't do it. <laughs> um, so flashing images, I think most groups don't do these anymore. Um, you have to be sensitive to people who may be sensitive to, um, to flashing lights who have um, some neurological um, sensitivities to flashing lights. Um, in the late 90s, there was an episode of Pokemon that actually caused a um, couple dozen kids in Japan to um, suffer seizures because the lights were just um, really, really aggressive. So there's a tool as well that people can use to see, like, is your website have, uh, is your website liable to trip that option? Um, and that's always useful because that's just a really, that's, in addition to music being really loud or a video automatically starting, if that also takes place, I'm less likely to visit your, you know, your page again or use your product or whatever your website is trying to do, I'm probably not going to come back to it. Um, so scrolling uh, considerations, you have to make sure that like any elements that are on your page, like um, images that fly by, um, can be paused so people can actually look at them. Um, keyboard functionality, I have a lot of fun with this one because um, for some of the staff that I work with, they come to me constantly with problems say, my mouse skipped. It's like, no, your mouse, your, your cursor didn't skip. Um, you're just touching your trackpad. So we tend to disable the trackpads for some of our staff because they will otherwise touch it and come to us with complaints about it later. So if something happens and they lose their mouse and we have to get a new one, we have to tap through our website or we have to tap through wherever we're going. Um, so that's, um, so a good test, if you don't want to like call up a um, if you don't want to call up a screen reader or you don't want to invest in anything just yet, is just try it. Like if you go on your website and you start pressing tab, does it make sense the way you're going? If you're pressing tab and you're doing your cursor keys, can you get to a page that you want to get to, um, or are you confused, or are you being sent to a completely random place? So that's always a very practical consideration to have. So, so uh, before I started working here at Cradles, I worked for UMass Medical School. And um, I worked for a particular division called CEDAR, uh, C-double-D-E-R, it's the Center for Disabilities Evaluation um, and Research. And what we did there was provide re uh, research for the state and for big businesses who wanted to um, work around um, accessibility issues for people with either uh, physical disabilities or people who had IBD disabilities. So DDS here in Massachusetts actually was a big client of ours. So um, what this comes to is for every document that uh, we produce for them, like any report, any graph, any summary, um, we had to clear this document for accessibility. It was legally a requirement that we had to have uh, because a lot of our funding, again, came from state or federal sources, which is uh, pretty massive. So has anyone here tagged a document before? Oh, I hate it too. Do you? <laughs> um, especially when you have 150-page documents with graphs. So this is luckily an innate feature in Adobe. Um, in the PDF reader. So um, you go into tools, you go into accessibility, and you start uh, your check just to see if I were a person using a screen reader, how well would I be able to read this website? Or I'm sorry, how well would I be able to read this document? Um, so it does things, um, it does things like have you, you know, read the flow. So if you have your header here, your subheader here, you have two columns, you know, you have to make sure the first column is tagged as the first paragraph, second paragraph is pat, uh, tagged as the next one, because otherwise I'm going to hear about, you know, the War of 1812, not that great, and then I'm going to jump into the second paragraph about 
economic conditions that led to the War of 1812. And that's just not really helpful. I'm going to be confused while I'm start why I am starting on the second paragraph instead of the first, I'm sorry, the second column instead of the first column. Um, and so you make all your changes from there. It's very time consuming, but it's well worth it if someone can read your document in full. Um, so. Um, and another smaller part of that that I think a lot more people are familiar with is alt tags in images. So um, I just grabbed a screenshot of our current website and a picture that we have and a little ditty about a descriptive alt text about um, what someone will be seeing or rather what their screen reader will be telling them. So that's pretty cool. So for people with vision issues, one of the big considerations is, you know, can they read whatever's going on in there? Um, so the bottom left um, document, you see it's awfully crunched together. I mean, stylistically great, you know, you're fitting a lot of uh, information there. But for someone who has macular degeneration um, or just has general vision impairment issues, that's going to be very difficult to read. Um, Conversely, on the other side, where you have like very deep paragraphs, very deep space between the paragraphs, that's gonna, um, that's gonna, for some people I know, it may cause them to lose their place because there's so much of, there's so much white space in between that now it's harder to read. So um, either way, um, the left and the right side, it's gonna be more difficult to read. Um, so the middle two you might want to go through, I kind of like the second one uh, a little bit more. So when you, overall, when you're just presenting your text and font, just make sure it's, um, it's easier to read both like for general audiences and then someone who is using a screen reader. Um, so when you know, they go to use a screen reader, things are clearly broken up into accessible chunks. Um, so that'll include um, how it's spaced, if there's bullets, if if it's just like one long sentence, it's for anyone that's going to be a turn off. Um, and especially with the way screen readers work, you can fast forward almost um, from one section to the other. And if it's if it's literally you know 500 word paragraph, that's a lot of information I'm skipping over. Otherwise, I'm have to am forced to like sit there and view in order to find what I want. So a plugin that I particularly like um, is the accessibility plugin, uh, or I guess the accessibility widget. Um, I think everyone knows that if you press Control and Plus, or Control and Minus, you're going to zoom in and out of the page. Some people may not know that, but it's important, I feel, just to give the option of having a, an actual plus and minus sign on your website. It's very unintrusive. Um, so people can view the text closer or further away, depending on what their um, vision needs are. So this is just a little snippet of, hey, this is nice to have if you're creating a website and you want that particular thing to be an option for you people. I strongly recommend it is an option to give your viewership. Oh, um, and you can also make it follow so, some of your, um, your own personal branding. So, <laughs> so this is actually a, um, yeah, so this is something that I think is actually meant more for like product purchases. Um, but this will allow someone to zoom in very close to an image. So um, the way I think this would be useful for someone is, you know, you've got someone who's looking at their 50 year reunion website, you know, they're looking at the class of how to do math on the fly. They're looking at their 1960 something um, class photo. Well, that's like, you know, maybe 200 people. So if they want to like see, they remember that, oh, I was on the bottom third row, they can zoom in instead of peering very, you know, frustratedly at the screen, they can zoom in and see every um, person and, you know, find them, find their friend, whoever. Um, so these are two um, apps that let you do that. Again, I think they were primarily meant for products where you could sort of see, um, you could sort of see the texture of this vase or what have you. Um, and another feature um, that I found for screen zooming in and out of the screen is font resizer. 
I like the other option better, but it's always there for you in case you're really not a fan of um, working in your theme, or maybe your uh, settings do not allow you to do that. Um, so, media. So you have two options as far as media that I'm going to discuss. So obviously, um, everyone knows YouTube. Everyone knows YouTube has a captions feature. The innate YouTube um, captions feature is awful. It's as terrible as you would expect an automated machine to do. Um, things aren't capitalized. Uh, there's no punctuation, things like that. The there, there, and there is wrong. Um, so you have to upload captions, which I also did my time at UMass, um, to make sure that um, when people are speaking, the captions get uploaded um, appropriately and time them and everything. So something that I think is really cool is Ozplayer. So it's actually created by an Australian company. Um, and what it is, is it actually does a, a lot more of an intuitive, a lot more, um, I, I, I don't want to say better, but it's a, it's a more robust media viewing experience. Um, it's um, created free for nonprofits under a million with operating budgets. Um, other agencies can get licenses for it. Um, it's available as a plugin as well for your uh, WordPress site. Um, and it's overall, if there's something you can do to make your site uh, better for individuals, we recommend it. So a couple resources that um, I recommend, it's, I mean, this is the United States, try the government's site. Um, it will test your documents, um, it will test your website. Um, I've, just through attending a couple panels here, have found that there are other individuals who also do, um, individuals who run companies who will also do um, website accessibility checks for you. Not, uh, it's for free, it's cool, that's kind of nice. Um, so, group, so if you're not a developer, if you're just a company that's looking forward to, like looking to do this, um, there's other resources out there. Index is actually a, it's a department within UMass um, that is run by a person who actually he himself has vision impairments, so he knows more than anyone why it's important to have accessible websites. Um, so I would recommend Index First. It's local, it's here in Massachusetts. It's based out of Worcester, so um, that's pretty cool. WebAIM, um, I also like them. Accessibility Oz are the folks who uh, put together the Oz player that we just looked over. Um, and I attended a nifty panel yesterday from Hex Productions. Um, they're based in the UK. Uh, that might be a difficult trip to expense, but it's always worth looking at. Um, and then a couple other resources, just in general, if you're looking for more, um, if you're sort of lo looking for more things to um, supplement, like some things you, you come here and see. So feel free to um, check them out. Um, and then Gutenberg, this is a slide I added um, just yesterday because I attended a couple Gutenberg panels and um, I wasn't sure anything about it, but I did know that um, while they were testing it out, they did a horrible text box where it was lime green background and like yellow font and Gutenberg stopped and said, are you sure you want to use that? Um, so that's kind of nice that they are like it, it has some accessibility features built in. And at least, it won't stop poor color choices, but it will at least make you aware of them. Um, so I don't know too much about Gutenberg yet, but uh, it's, it seems promising. Um, we'll see you next year, right? So thank you for coming. Sorry for the time delay. Um, if anyone has any questions, I will try to answer them. heard the rule of thumb is fourth grade. Um, back when I worked um, at the center that my mom works for in upstate New York, um, like we had kids who were considered like very low functioning, but this one kid we had, like one, one of the uh, students we had, 
he was obsessed with watching videos of people getting their hair brushed. So he could obviously, you know, people didn't, like his teachers didn't have a lot of expectations for him, but he knew how to find like what he needed. And this was in like uh, 2002, so, so fourth grade. Can you sp uh, speak up a little bit? I'm sorry. So the question was, um, do I know of any um, plugins that can work for people who have mobility issues, who might otherwise have issues like navigating it with a mouse? Um, there is, and I can't remember the name of it specifically now, but there's a roller ball. It looks exactly like a mouse. It's got a giant red ball. Um, and you, and this is I think actually used for people more, or originally was used for people with a carpal tunnel. Um, so that's an adaptive device that you would use to navigate to, you know, links that would make it a lot easier than just the teeny tiny trackpad or, you know, the inch long um, left and right cl but, uh, click buttons on a mouse. That's the only thing I can think of so far. Yes? Um, I haven't come across anything like that personally. Um, I mean, it's something we can, I can definitely research um, just for my own knowledge sake. Uh, I don't do development as much anymore, so, um, so there's that. But um, that's a good thing to look at because I did mention um, motor issues as one of my bullet points for like things you have to look out for. <laughs> hey, um, I just, you might if I chime in on the previous questions. Um, one of the great things about accessible uh, hardware for uh, motor control issues uh, is most of them map to mouse. Um, so the biggest thing in terms of software accessibility for motor control um, hardware is uh, making sure that you have large touch areas, which is good for touch screens. So no very small tiny touch points in the very small 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 small. And the other thing is making sure you have a single intent for each thing you use. So for example, if the hover is only a hover, it's only a hover. But um, when you start to add multiple things to each other, it's like it does, it's much harder for if someone is using a to or an eye track or a wind control to actually use to, to get that. All right, thank you. And I'm being told we're guillotining someone. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>